look, it's not your fault that the wildfires in Canada are happening because of you. What you do know is that um, how you can help people like your neighbors or your friends of how to protect themselves. And those are the things where I feel like as young people, we always point at each other and being like, well, did you know this? Or no one's talking about this, so you should know. And it's like, we, we, are, we do live in a shame culture now where in my year, like when I was in college, we lived in Instagram. Now TikTok's obviously the big platform now, but it's like people would always shame me for not knowing what was happening um, about a shooting that happened three days ago when I was traveling to another country. And I was like, I, I just can't process the trauma every day. I'm not saying that I have to ignore it. I'm just saying like as humans, like we have to be able to center ourselves too, to be like, we're, we're going to be okay. Uh, good evening and welcome to your library. Uh, and welcome to the Abbey Room here at the Copley Square location of the Boston Public Library, Central Library here in downtown Boston. I'm David Leonard, president of the Boston Public Library and moderator of our public conversation series. Uh, tonight is actually the final installment of our spring-summer season of public conversations and represents the intersection of our Pride Month programming for June as well as this year's theme of climate action, climate justice, which we are calling You Are Here, Climate Change and What's Next. And so for this fifth conversation in our season, we are turning to an emerging influencer and leader, someone who brings multiple identities and true intersectionality to the conversation. Our guest has described himself as queer, brown, vegan environmentalist. He is Isaias Hernandez. Isaias was born in LA, in California, also known as Tongva Land. He grew up in Section 8 housing, was a recipient of food stamps, and lived in a community that faced environmental injustice. These first-hand experiences are where he'd eventually find his passion for the environment, social justice, and equity. As Isaiah witnessed the ways pollution affected his body and community, he turned his anger and sadness into a solution, creating environmental education that would prioritize accessibility and intersectionality. Now Isaiah seeks to help everyone educate themselves on the intersectional nature of the climate crisis. He believes in diversity, believes a diversity of worldviews, backgrounds and experiences are essential to achieve success in the environmental movement. The climate crisis is an educational crisis and forms of education that can be sustained outside of our institutions will help to address it. He has earned his bachelor's in environmental science from the University of California. Uh, claims to fame, including interviewing Vice President Kamala Harris, being featured on the digital cover of Vogue with Billie Eilish, and on the Harvard Sea Change program as Climate Creators 2023 program. Isaias is currently living in LA, working as a full-time content creator for the organization he founded, Queer Brown Vegan, a public speaker and a consultant. And in his free time, he enjoys reading, we like reading, cooking, foraging, and connecting in ecological wealth. Uh, please join me in welcoming Isaias to our program this evening. Um, so based on the bio, we, we already, I think, have a lot to, to talk about. But I, I'd like to give you the opportunity to, in your own words, tell us a little bit about, um, about yourself and how you got started in this work. Um, just a little bit about me is that, yes, I am queer, brown, and vegan. Um, but the most interesting things I think I like to start off um, with my life on that end. You know, growing up for me, it was very interesting because um, I think at a very young age, um, like many immigrant household families, like you're grown or you're forced to live in a world of poverty, but then you're also forced to learn um, the language that you speak, both English and then also the foreign language that your parents speak. And I remember like recognizing that, you know, I knew that we didn't have that much resources growing up, but I was always forced and told, work hard in school, do what you need to do. Um, but I also grew up in a very religious family structural household uh, with Catholicism. And I remember just recognizing um, how this really influenced and really affected the way that I navigated the world. 
Um, and so, you know, my, all, my whole life throughout high school, I really struggled with this idea of like what I wanted to be or who I was as an individual. Um, I took a lot of jobs when I was already a teenager working, um, quote unquote, illegally with my father, um, gardening rich affluent people homes in LA because my dad is a, um, we call it like a gardener, a laborer. Mm -hmm. And um, I also sold chips and soda in high school. So I was one of those kids that really hustled to afford like his first laptop, get his first cell phone and just things like that. But I really struggled with this idea of like, what is it that I really wanted to do? And I remember learning about climate change when I was in middle school. Um, back then it was called global warming. And I remember um, you know, talking about the effects about what it does and how it creates pollution, it hurts your health. And that kind of got me just curious about like, okay, maybe I want to do something in the environment. All I knew is I was, I had to go to college. Like my parents were like, you have to go to university to get the quote unquote American dream or to achieve that success. And so I applied to um, different universities and it was funny because I didn't really want to apply to Berkeley at the time. I said, I'll, I'll probably, I can't get in. Like they have a GPA of 4.0. I have like a 3.6 from high school. I didn't do that well in high school, but I did average. And so I said, okay, I'll just apply. And I applied and I got in um, on that end. And so that really, um, go to the next slide, please. Um, that really affected just like my ways of just navigating um, the world. And I ended up studying environmental science because um, I had this really huge passion for research, evidence, and how to communicate this to communities of color who didn't really have that experience. And um, I'd say that my environmental program that I learned was really interesting because while I came out as queer when I was 18 in college um, and started to recognize well, what does my identity really have to do with the environment? I started to recognize that I started to really silo myself apart from those spaces, meaning that when I was in research spaces, I worked a lot with typically older professors that were usually men and white and they were straight. And so anytime discussions of sexuality or politics would come up, you just wouldn't really say anything. And so I, I really just stood quiet in terms of like, in my professional academic relationships, I was just scared to talk about queerness because I just said, oh, well, it's not related to this research or I'm scared that they'll remove me from the research project, even though this is a very liberal institution and a lot of people always think, you know, they're very safe spaces, but sometimes they're not. Um, go to the next slide. Um, but if you wanna to go to the next thing on that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I um, that, that's, that's interesting um, about, uh, you know, because I think I think we're going to get into what what does being gay or queer have to do with um, the environment per se. And yeah. last week's conversation, we we actually had a guest who was talking about the connections of uh, the impacts of uh, climate change on communities of color in particular. Yeah. And so I think this concept of the environment not being something that's entirely separate from ourselves, but who we are uh, is as much to do with how we approach this question. So um, I'm hearing in what you're saying something about, you know, if we're not able to be fully ourselves, then we don't fully engage in learning and educational experience. And that's certainly something to do, I think, with, um, you know, if you're not coming out till you're 18, then prior to coming out, you're not necessarily going to be fully engaged in, in this particular topic. So that's, that's kind of my first take on, on um, yeah. how these things are connected. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the issues with a lot of queer youth today, and I'm so happy to see there's more representation out there, is that um, you know when you enter pre predominantly um, mm. universities that are very elite, um, they don't really serve communities of color, but they don't serve kids that come from poverty. Or they don't serve um, this idea of multiculturalism. And so while I'm trying to identify or experience my identity, mm -hmm. I'm also poor, but then I'm also having to take multiple jobs mm -hmm. and then I'm having to also um, deal with social relationships that affect me as an academic. And so during my time at Berkeley, I remember just being very shy, not really feeling as smart enough from my peers. I remember just always listening and not really um, what you would say, synthesizing the information of what that meant to me. Mm -hmm. And so I think the ways in which I engage with academia wasn't really much on you know knowing the definition, but I knew what it meant through the embodiment of our actions. And so as a, as a queer scientist, I remember recognizing that 
um, my friends that were, of course, queer and trans, they'd be like, you know, what do I have to do with the environment? And that's when I started to see that we are, we, we already start to separate ourselves from nature because mm -hmm. nature itself is um, species, right? Human species, um, animal species, um, non-human or, or organism species that exist in our world. And I started to realize that more and more that when climate crisis affects us, so like, um, I think there's a study that was out there that a lot of people who face homelessness that are youth, 40% of them identify as LGBT. Yeah. So what ends up happening is that when those queer and trans communities are affected by like, let's say right now the wildfires mm -hmm. um, or flooding in different areas, a lot of them don't have the resources mm -hmm. to protect themselves. But then let's say they go to these camps like FEMA mm -hmm. um, and Red Cross. And one of the things I remember reading in college is that when a lot of queer and trans people go to FEMA related camps or disaster relief camps, um, it's not to hate or bash on any religion of Christianity, of course, but um, a lot of the members are predominantly Christian. And so some of the volunteers there are sometimes homophobic and transphobic towards them. But then also those communities already don't feel safe because they're already gendered. They're told you can only use this restroom because you look like a male or you look like a woman. Um, and so for, for disaster relief in the climate realm, um, there is no really safety net for these communities of color. And so as a queer scientist during my time in Berkeley, I started to recognize like if they don't feel safe already from the ends of disaster and I don't feel safe already, how are we going to create pathways to ensure that we start to really have these conversations? So, so basically, um, one of your points is that, you know, people who are already disenfranchised um, yeah. are going to be doubly disenfranchised in the face of a crisis, mm -hmm. especially because organizations and systems um, that are designed to help people in general are not trained or equipped to deal with people who are different from, from the mainstream. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's go back to the, the, the identities, because um, I'm going to play with four until you correct me, right? Yeah. Queer, brown, vegan, environmentalist. Did they all come to you at once? Is there a particular order that this stacked up in? Or, uh, or and how did you synthesize it at the end of the day? Yeah, it, it's funny because um, I think my name's Isaiah, but um, throughout my whole life, um, I never knew how to really pronounce my name in English because I only knew how to pronounce it in Spanish. My parents are, um, they're from Mexico, so they would uh -huh. call me Isaias in Spanish. But then I'd have um, American teachers be like, what's your name? And I'm like, I only know how to say in Spanish. And I remember I had a teacher in first grade and she says, well, this is America, so you say your name in English. And I just was like, I didn't know. I mean, you're, I'm a right. seven year old kid. And I, I, I remember just like saying like, I don't know, can you help me? And she said, yes. And she, would, she said, e, um, Isaiah, she would say Isis to me. Um, she would just say all these random names. And so mm. throughout, even throughout mm. higher ed, um, I, the professors couldn't really pronounce my name and I said how is it that you can pronounce a European name so eloquently but then you look at my name you're like I don't know how to spell your name it's too difficult for me so I, I just um, created the queer brown vegan brand because I just thought well that's more marketing creative strategy but it's also like I think it's funny because like sometimes I'm in random areas and people are like I don't know your name but I know you're queer brown vegan and I'm like you know that's better for me that people know the brand in some way than my real name because um, sometimes people butcher it and it's not their fault too I try to understand but um, the idea was just to recognize that like you know, I have all these um, value systems in my face, but mm. one is that I cannot really er erase my color. Like I am a brown person that navigates the world. And yes, I do admit that I have um, the light skin privilege that has allowed me to, of course, be in that social ladders. But then I also like as a queer person of color, like um, it's been something that where I felt like, you know, um, I have also had the privilege compared to like my other friends that are queer and trans where it's like, in the street, I can look like a cis straight male if I'm not talking to you or if you're, I'm not interacting. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, as a queer person of color, it's like I know that that still is going to affect me when I walk into rooms, when I walk into business negotiations, when I still talk to people. And I think the veganism component, it was more about the branding. But I, I do think that the veganism came from the fact that, like, when we think about veganism or just plant based eating, people think about only like, white hippie yoga people and it's like no like i'm a person of color that um really reconnects my own cultural experiences from mushrooms and foraging in mexico into the work i do today and how do i want to ensure that communities of color that 
um, our undocumented farm workers that are, are that are you know essentially holding this food system alive today um, are victims of this issue, and I need to really divest away from that system in some way, in which I can, as someone who does have obviously economic um, privilege to say no to institutions. So, so Zena, the experience of this this people not being able to pronounce your name is an early experience of dealing with the brown part of the identity yeah. in some ways. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned uh, coming out as queer is at about 18. Um, yeah. And the, the vegan thing and putting it all together is really as much branding as it is values in some ways. Um, so do you find that this putting it together um, is also a way of combating stereotypes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, we're such a diverse world down in the US. I mean, it's like the year's 2023, you see such really great styles of people and like identities and value systems now yeah. Then you know, I would say that for me, 20, I went from school from 2014 to 2018, that's such a, I mean, it's such a long time ago. I always tell friends it's been almost like five or six years since I've graduated. And- You'll uh, make me feel old if you keep up that distinction. <laughs> we'll go the decades, um, <laughs> but I'm getting to the decades soon, but, um, I, I think it's more about this idea of like breaking these narratives of what we think about environmentalists because mm. my duty and my whole role of my world's life work today is to really help people understand more about mm. climate and no longer see it as a belief system but more as a factual evidence incidence that mm. is happening today. And I think in our minds, right, we've been indoctrinated here in America to think about um, you know, when we think about environmentalists, mm. we can probably think about Jane Goodall, David Attenborough, mm. Greta Thunberg, and they've mm. all done really great work. Right. But why is it that the three people that we think about in environmentalism are white people? Mm. Why can't we think about black and indigenous people mm -hmm. that have been at the forefront of these movements? Um, why don't we talk about Harriet Tubman that mm. was a naturalist mm. um, and knew how to talk to animal species in order to liberate um, black people who were enslaved by colonizers. Like these are things that are often lost in our dominant history narratives. And I think through my work, it's to really uncover um, those perspectives of the queer people, mm -hmm. especially two-spirit um, indigenous mm -hmm. individuals um, that are in our movements today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm struck by, by two of our former guests in this series on this, this later topic because uh, I think both Wawa Gatherer, who I think yeah. you know, um, and Steve Corwood, uh, both of whom are also uh, people of color, talked about the way in which the environmental movement um, is led by a largely white um, uh, group of people, uh, or traditionally has been so, and yet at the same time, at the grassroots level, um, it is very much uh, communities of color that are that are trying to make bring about real change. Yeah, do, do, is that does that match your experience? Um, yeah, I mean, I think for any Black Indigenous person of color, and also any marginalized identity out there, we can all relate when we've been um, faced with otherization, or we felt isolated, or we felt like you know I don't belong here, mm. um, or I don't think I'm smart enough to be here, mm. and. Um, I think Berkeley, or just anyone who attends any college, it's a really rough time for them, like just for them magically, their, their values and what they're going through. Um, and I, I think um, on that end, like I already felt like I was never smart enough mm. compared to my white environmental friends who, I love them to death. I mean, some of them are lawyers now, but it's like I never felt smart with them because they had these very, um, privilege of bringings to be able to experience the outdoors or to meet these famous environmentalists. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like, oh, I, I don't have that experience. I just clean gardens for rich people and I feel ashamed about it. So mm -hmm. my experience is not the same as yours and therefore your, your value and your experience of what you've grown up um, is well, much more noble than mine. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of um, poor people who grow up poor, they already are disempowered to feel like you're not good enough. And I feel like that took me a lot of years to kind of come forth. It's like, I'm not angry that I'm not rich, or I wasn't angry at my parents specifically for being poor. It was more about the idea of like, I feel bad that I valued luxury experiences mm -hmm. that I thought that was the end all be all mm -hmm. when the person who had control of my story was myself. Mm -hmm. I just never believed that I was able to produce work 
just for myself. So, so how did that change come about in your own journey then? Yeah, um, I think it like really came about um, from just like really recognizing like, you know, in academia, I started to, the ways that you learn in academia is that they teach you how to profit off of nature. Mm -hmm. So um, I took a lot of environmental economics courses and forestry courses and fishery courses. Um, and you start to realize that, you know, other species are already devalued. So if we are devaluing those species, they're going to devalue people who look like me that mm -hmm. are not white, right? I started to realize like our generation today, like a lot of kids you grow up, they don't really recognize a lot of the plants on the right side versus mm -hmm. on the left side. We've allowed corporations to become such um, corporate, we've allowed corporations to become humans essentially. Mm -hmm. And so when I graduated college, um, I actually applied to all the environmental nonprofits thinking my route and my goal is to become environmental strategists. I got mm -hmm. rejected from Greenpeace, 350, Sierra Club, um, a lot of just organizations during that time. Um, and so I remember like, uh, just feeling like a failure and it was really weird because I, I ended up getting a job in New York City working in the fashion industry and that was a really unique time during 2018 to 2020. Huh. Um, I ended up leaving and started to recognize that no one was really communicating um, environmental education online and I hated my job. Um, anyone who's really interested in any fashion related careers like the environment intersects with the environment because it pollutes the planet But I just felt like I wasn't living my best life. I felt mm -hmm. like I really want to just teach people about environmental education mm -hmm. and that's not really being taught so um, One day I had like, you know, just crying in the subway as humans, right? We all suffer. We all experience things and I was just saying I hate that I live in New York now, like barely had any friends, working mm -hmm. at a very extreme toxic job that was two years mm -hmm. out. And I remember my friend called me and they were like, why don't you create something on social media or an art project? And mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do that without thinking that I don't have any expectations. Mm -hmm. And so I created Queer Brown Vegan to communicate that mm -hmm. information and it started off as a very simple, like infographic account, just, you know, my basic design skills. Um, and so then I created marketing and strategy on that end. And then it ended up growing into a, a media platform mm -hmm. now where I just focus on um, working with those same nonprofits that rejected me as a consultant sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, communicating information and working on digital media production. Mm -hmm. So um, allowing black and indigenous people of color to work with me or I teach them ways in which they can create their brands or how to edit, write, um, design your own brand mm -hmm. because this is not really taught and I felt like I need to be able to prepare the next younger generation because they don't I don't want them to suffer like I did. It, it's always fascinating to me that um, you know some of these uh, decision points in our lives um, or you know journeys uh, you know that that take us to a place where we can be more of ourselves more of our full potential mm -hmm. often come about purely um, almost accidentally or simply in a crisis or in response to a moment and it sounds to me like um, you know you your steps to create this platform and brand and mission were also um, uh, you know what helped you find your voice that also built your own confidence and was in itself validating of your voices as important as, as anybody else's. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the original goal, and it's sad to say this, because I always tell people like the idea of like being called influencer today, it's really interesting because I, when I created the account, I didn't think, of, I only thought about environmental education, teach mm -hmm. people about my personal experiences and give as much information yeah. out there for free. Of course, you know, that's really the, the realm of the work. Mm -hmm. But then I started to realize like years later how much dangerous that was because the idea of um, social media centering individuals can sometimes be dangerous right. where it's like, right. I didn't really want to have a large following and that ended up being a, a responsibility on my end now realizing mm -hmm. that like now you've grown this account, you've educated people about these issues. Right. So now what's And you next? have an audience. I have an audience and I, I think the importance is to now, how do we move these conversations outside of social media? And I felt like that's been really hard with the pandemic that just yeah. happened, the wildfires. No, I mean, I also think, you know, if you start to use this word influencer to cover a multitude, yeah. uh, if you look back to what would we have called people who um, have that role, it would, they would have been educators or leaders. 
Yeah. And so I think the good side of, of influencing is simply another way of being an educator or, or a leader. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, um, you know, so, so this came later, but it leveraged your undergraduate degree because that, that gave you some of the um, experience and understanding of the space. Although it sounds like a lot of that was focused on more extractive work in the environment than necessarily yeah. uh, values-based approach. Yeah, I, I think it's funny because I went to college originally because, yes, my parents forced me, but I thought in order to save the world or in order to be a true environmentalist, yeah. you needed a degree. And that's really elitist and that's very like inaccessible for me to say. I mean, I was 18, of course, I said a lot of things that I should have not, but I had to learn that that's also problematic because I do believe that everyone here, regardless if you care about the environment in some way, like you are an environmentalist. It's not about the degrees and your expertise. Of course, value systems should be respected of those who have more knowledge and how to you know, co-create. Um, but it was more about after you know, having, living in a very stressful work environment, being isolated in New York mm. to a certain extent, mm. um, and then having to deal with this idea of like, you think you're going to college to get a degree to save your family, to save yourself, but then you realize the money doesn't really add up. So you're in this system of like, how do I support my family? And I need to support myself. And then I don't feel mentally and physically good. So then how do I continue the system? And so I started to recognize that social media was also a way for me to be able to be more accessible um, and to be able to kind of create a different opportunity because I realized too a lot of my friends who are women of color or queer and trans people they'd work for these environmental organizations mm -hmm. and they got exploited and they got ran to the ground and then they got kicked out and I said mm -hmm. if I got treated in a fashion industry that way and they're getting treated that mm -hmm. same way as me mm -hmm. does that mean that we have like future viable careers to actually care for us and mm -hmm. I started to really mistrust companies yeah. saying that we care about mental health and I'm like mental health for who? because it's clearly not shown in the employees. Right. That the, the, whole, the whole system may in fact be problematic, yeah. not just the individual experiences. Um, so okay, so you, you start this platform, um, um, and, and we, we could, um, I do want to talk about ecology in a second, but, yeah. but, but you start the platform. How soon do you know that you're onto something that's really resonating, and who is it resonating with, and, and what what, what, how does that manifest itself to you during, during those first year or so? Uh, of doing content yeah. creation? Yeah, I mean, anyone who's just really interested in just communicating, I think a lot of people are just inspired by stories, right? Like a lot of the times mm -hmm. I talk about, I think random things in my life or like things that made me angry, things that made me sad, or a lot of this um, at Queer Brown Vegan, my team really focused now on climate solutions, but on indigenous wisdom and storytelling and mm -hmm. mythology. Um, I'm a very geek when it comes to learning about mythology and um, ancient cultures mm -hmm. and histories because I feel like there's a lot of parallels that can be applied or metaphorically to see things. And so what really resonates with the audience, and I will say that it's really sad to also see this gendered thing, is that 89% um, of my audience are um, women and then ninth, I think 11% are men. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back to this idea that like, um, that men in dominant masculine cultures, toxic masculine cultures believe that caring about the environment is a gay thing. Mm. Um, when it's really not, it should not even be a gendered thing, right? To even care about it. But um, I'd say like with the, what really has resonated with people is just the, yes, the authenticity, the vulnerability, but the solutions piece. Because I think today in our world, like everyone, every, like, everything's unfolding right now, right? Like you all just experienced the wildfires that literally choked people's lungs and like made you cough all last yeah. week. Um, we're seeing massive floods in, in Los Angeles. It literally rained yesterday or two days ago and that it never rains. I've lived in LA my entire life. And so we're seeing all these like very um, extra um, ab abnormal um, events that are happening. And so I tell people like, we're so focused on problem identification, but we're not solutions oriented. So anyone's able to say like, yes, corporations admit, yes, we all have a responsibility to save the planet, but no one really wants to focus on those local solutions of like, did you know that your community in Boston is creating this type of program to help develop these solutions? Mm -hmm. And so more people are wanting to use social media as an anchor to be able to have that conversation. And so my goal is to really just kick people off of the, the learning stage and be like, all right, now you're going to become the teacher. 
Because learning without action is yeah, like it's, it's not, essentially... not finishing the yes. job, right? So <laughs> exactly. Um, and I, I do, I do love the fact that 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 storytelling is what's at the heart of what what has helped you find your voice. And Correct. here we are in a library, which is essentially about um, storytelling. So queer ecology. The, yeah. the, the sense of ecology and ecological wealth shows up a lot in your writings and your podcasts. So tell us a little bit about what, what that is. Yeah, so I think I'll go off with the ecological wealth first. So um, everyone knows the generational wealth, the American dream. It's talked about in The Great Gatsby, I believe, and during that time, I think. But anyway, the American dream is obviously is a lie. Like we all know that it only selected a select few individuals and classes um, in our society, and that really dream has ended for a lot of immigrants. Um, but the ecological wealth is to really understand that um, we are trying to really build true wealth of valuing species after recognizing that what does generational wealth even mean when that's not going to mean anything when we don't have access to clean air, water, and soil. Like, I mean, indigenous communities have always said, you cannot buy um, water, you cannot, you can, you know, like it, water is being privatized as we speak, but we cannot afford to lose water, we cannot afford to lose fresh air. Um, and so when I started to recognize this idea of like even my own friends working at unfortunately exploitative organizations or companies after college is that, you know, we all think about, well, my family or I want to buy a house and I want to have multiple properties and I want to have all of these things for them. And I started to say, mm, I don't fully agree. I try to understand and have obviously grace for them but i started to recognize like generational wealth does not mean anything and our planet's dying like what does it mean to even buy a home when it's going to be flooded and those are the things i started to say like i need to really reevaluate the ways in which we're seeing capitalism like the the ways that we dispose of things so rapidly um it's horrific and so queer ecology um is a field that really examines um this this heteronormative world and for a more easier sense it's not to say like how do we look at straight people in the environment? It's not that. It's more saying that who is it, who for, why did we create the concepts around natural and unnatural? Why is it that when I was born and growing up religiously in a household, I was told being gay or trans or lesbian, whatever, is an unnatural thing in the world. But what does unnatural mean? If you look at plants, for example, um, they don't grow in uniformity. They don't grow perfect. They don't grow in a certain way, right? They grow in very diverse ways. And so queer ecology for me was this more um, metaphorical expression to be able to understand that there is no such thing as unnatural in, an, in a natural state of a world that is filled with diversity. And so, of course, a lot of people um, get really offended because they're like, well, what does you know, being straight have to do with me? Or is that the issue? And it's like, it's not really the issue. It's to say that queer and trans communities have been living in underground webs of systems. So like, if you look at mushrooms, one of the reasons why people think, well, for first of all, like scientifically, I guess you could say that um, some mycelium or mushrooms have thousands of sex species. So mm -hmm. Um, that's a really cool thing, but they have networks of underground roots that um, are able to be connected. And so a lot of queer and trans communities see that metaphorically because they've had to be hidden um, from our dominant society structure of like who is able to be freely out and which bodies are free. Um, if you look into, of course, like flowers or plants, like the blooming stages is seen as this very um, a unique experience mm -hmm. for queer and trans communities to come out. Like, I don't like to say come out of the closet anymore. It's more like they're blooming mm -hmm. um, into their newer selves. And um, I think with queer ecology, it's allowed me to build ecological wealth to understand like this world is filled with mysteries and unknowns. And I think that's the beauty of it is that we're not supposed to always have answers for everything. And I think homophobia and transphobia don't come from a human supremacist lens. They come from colonization and white supremacy. Because if you ask indigenous communities and people I've interviewed in indigenous communities, um, they've had people that are two-spirit. And two-spirit is basically people who have both masculine and feminine energy. They don't really prescribe to a gender. Mm -hmm. um, gender is heavily influenced by sociocultural norms. Um, animal species, right, engage in quote unquote, people say like unnatural relationships or homosexual relationships. But again, it's the idea that animal, animal kingdoms do not operate like our human species mm -hmm. because we are constructed and constricted by white supremacy mm -hmm. that tells us we're unnatural, natural. Like you don't see animals killing each other for engaging in right. any homosexual behavior. Right. 
So, I mean, part of it is certainly that there's a diversity in nature that is, you certainly can't sort into a simple binary, that really there, there's much more to be learned. And um, I, I also think that in, in the context of, you know, other examples, whether it's, it's penguins or um, other creatures or seahorses or, you know, name your favorite um, non-simple binary gendered creature, there's much more complexity there yeah. and that it's a reminder that the human construct of gender, uh, although it has some roots in biology, yeah. um, is not necessarily the end of the story. Yeah. Um, so I also uh, want to go back to this the notion of wealth. The, the American dream version of wealth, um, to me, suggests that it's wealth of an individual, by extension of family or generational, mm -hmm. um, but whereas what I think you're celebrating here is more the, ecolo the ecology, which is the whole system, the, uh, celebrating the wealth of the whole system, and that, that's what we need to do more of. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's about recognizing that, what is the wealth that you wanna have in society? Like, people will be like, oh, I have the latest Nike brand, I have Gucci, I have all of these luxury brands, and I remember having friends in college that were very obsessed with luxury brands and constantly consuming, and I really integrate um, the concept of mindfulness that comes from Buddhism, mm -hmm. And I started to recognize very at a young age too that I was like, honestly, like I don't really have money and I don't really care for these like fast fashion brands. Of course I use an Apple laptop, you know, like those are things of like what we have to use in yeah. society. But there's a concept of like, if I don't know, like during wildfires actually, there's, um, there's, a certain, there's certain plants that are used as a humidifier or to absorb mm -hmm. the toxins that come from mm -hmm. fires and you don't need to consume or anything, just leave it there. Um, those are like lost ecological knowledge that we're losing and um, I don't want to see young people, even myself, go into the forest and not know what's edible, right? Mm -hmm. I, I now learn foraging as a way to really reconnect to that wealth because mm -hmm. if anyone knows how painful it is during the, I think they grow here, they're called mulberries or wine berries. <laughs> um, to pick out these berries, it takes so much time. It takes me like two hours to get like a bucket full of berries or to hunt for mushrooms. It really takes a lot and you start to recognize um, the idea of like food sovereignty and having reverence mm -hmm. for these systems. So I'm not trying to protect the ecosystem because the ecosystem doesn't need my specific protection, it needs a reverence, it needs understanding and deep respect and I think a lot of us, um, you know, unfortunately didn't have those experiences or we were told to value the brands on the left because that's what's really what's going to make us successful in society. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was telling a friend the other day, like it's just, um, it's kind of horrific to see like even the corporatization of young people of like them wanting to be on Forbes 30 under 30 or like, you know, all these things. And it's like, do those accolades really matter at the end of the day when I'm just trying to do, I'm just trying to live my life to help others. So, so how do you feel then about being on the cover of some of the magazines or, or things? Is that, is that a source of tension or of progress? I think it's more of tension for myself internally. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very logistics of this idea of like, you know, people are like, oh, you work with these celebrities, you're a traitor yeah. to the people. And it's like, I, I really try to reckon with this idea of like, well, if, if it's not me to help amplify the voice out there for others, like who can it be? And there's also behind the scenes work of like, even like pitching my own friends that are younger than me in those opportunities. I feel like it's a, it's a vast end of like systems that we just cannot compete well, against. There's, there's a difference I think between it being a means to an end and to yeah. reach people versus seeing getting on the cover as the end in itself. Yes. I think those are two radically different yeah. uh, motivations. So, um, uh, what, what I'm also picking up is a great appreciation for um, indigenous culture, indigenous principles, indigenous people's values. When did that come to you in, 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 your, in your evolution and um, what, what should we be taking more of from that space? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, my parents are from Mexico and they actually, um, their stories are very unique because I think, uh, my mother has a lot of trauma from Mexico um, due to cartels, land theft, um, siblings going missing and things like that. But um, they come from a very large lineage of farmers. Um, my, my dad's side is actually interesting because my mom is the Spaniard um, 
guess you could say European, where like I go walk with my mom and people ask if she's like a white mom, mm-hmm. um, which is really interesting. I'm like, no, she's not. She's like Latina. But um, my dad is more from, I would say, he does have indigenous roots. I don't claim any indigeneity just because I never really met my grandparents. Yeah. And my dad has a lot of trauma that um, has been there. But I think one of the things that, that has inspired me is that they always were farmers. So they, my dad actually taught me how to prune or how to know when the mm. soil is uneven, even though um, he took this job in America as a landscaper mm. to work um, grossly underpaid mm. um, in LA and seeing how like rich people would even pay him like pennies, honestly. Um, I, I started to recognize like that's really wisdom that has been like lost and time. not really developed. Mm. And so I wanted to really rekindle that. And so as I'm writing my book right now, I've been really talking more about their experiences mm-hmm. of what they did. And I remember um, foraging last year and I sent a photo to my dad and he said, you know, it's funny because your grandma used to forage. I know you never met her because she died when my dad was like a teenager. Mm-hmm. And she, he said like, you know, she used to know where all the mushrooms were at in Mexico. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that you do, you're into foraging for mushrooms. And I just thought that's kind of a way that I honor yeah. like my grandparents or great grandparents who I never really met, but I only have photos of them of different landscapes that they were in Mexico to kind of remember um, based on that. And that's just someone that's just been obviously far removed and recognizing even the Latin. I mean, Latin people are not a race. I mean, like you can't, Mexican isn't a race. So like, it's interesting to always see the dynamic of like, you know, well, there's something there, but it's mixed colonization that has a large it, impact. It, it's reminding us that there's intersectionality yeah. to all of who we are yeah. and that you can't reduce any of these identities to as simple about skin color or tone or culture or ethnicity or um, national origin. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, as soon as we start to engage in dialogue about these, we should realize that we're, we're, we're all human beings and we just, we just have a, a mix of backgrounds. Yeah. And, um, some of the things we're forward with and others are, are, are part of our background. Um, the, the fourth part of this little identity square that I've got going on is the, the vegan component. <laughs> tell, tell us about, about that as, um, as part of yeah. the, Either as part of the work or as part of who you are. Yeah, um, I think we'll just start. Yeah, that's it. Um, I think the vegan component just really comes out of the fact that like, I stopped eating meat um, six, almost six years ago. I took this like global food system course and basically I had to argue which is better, GMO meat or organic beef meat. Right. And I was like, what are the I was very conflicted right. internally because I was like, okay, well, I know organic beef is like less cruel, but then the animal still gets like slaughtered. So I was just like, I had this very like really huge contemplation in myself of like, look, I value like communities that eat locally mm. um, or what they have to do. Mm. I rely on this very heavy global food system. Mm. So I get all of my food from an industrial grocery market. I, I don't go to farmer's markets. I can't afford them. Like this is during college. Right. And so I was like, well, it's a privileged thing. Like I really, and I, I do think today it's still a privileged thing. Like I do believe that there are people who are poor who can't go vegan. There are people who are poor who can go vegan. It's very complex and nuanced, but I do think the vegan component just came from the fact that I saw this as like an extensionary, an expansionary tool for liberation to understand mm-hmm. animal species. Like I think collectively, even if you're vegan or not, I, I think everyone can agree. I don't think sea world should exist because they're literally hurting the orcas. I don't think that um, certain um, circuses should exist where animals are gaining whipped like that and exploited in that industry. Like we can agree, even if you're vegan or not, that those industries shouldn't exist. Mm-hmm. I don't agree. Um, with sometimes, um, you know, um, police systems using non-human animals as a way to capture people knowing that the animal probably will get shot and killed first. Mm. Um, like where, where are like the protections of those? And so I started to really recognize that, um, for myself as an environmentalist, Mm. I don't believe that everyone should go vegan. I just believe that we should all do our part to reduce Mm. our consumption, to say no to these industries. And I made the link few years ago myself, like researching and reading obviously Mm -hmm. academic papers where undocumented farm workers are forced to work in these horrific industries. But right now what we're seeing with the border crisis in the United States is that um, young children are being smuggled from Mexico, Ecuador, other Latin American countries, and they're being forced to work in these slaughterhouses. And then the issue is that 
you know, people say, well, why don't they go back to their home? The issue is that the people who kidnap them and they go to, and ICE doesn't, ICE is so horrible. They do not do um, any job to protect these young people. Um, they sell them off to these other cartel owners. The cartel owners then threaten the children and say, if you ever speak up or say anything to the police, we're going to unalive your family back in Latin America. So already you're, these kids that are 15, 16, 17, mm -hmm. Um, are not only have to work in the late evenings, but then have to go to school. And everyone, everyone that works in those rural areas and those farm towns um, know that those kids are failing their classes because they can't sleep. And so I saw veganism as both a human rights issue and an animal rights issue and wanting to really just draw those comparisons to ensure that I'm not just for the animals, I'm right. for all species. So, so it's a mixture, really, of respect for animals, um, uh, choices about what you want to consume in your own body, and also an analysis of the global food, food supply system, yeah. right? Um, I mean, I think different people can choose one or more of those sets of values being personally motivating or, or, or not. Um, but you also have now gone, and, and I think, rightly linked again, how interconnected all of this is by looking at challenges with immigration. I mean, what you describe sounds more like slavery than anything yeah. else to me. Um, and it's interdependence with some aspects of the, the industrial food supply system. Um, uh, and so I think, I think not many people are aware of how all of that really is interconnected at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everyone probably has seen online like the Taco Bell has like a vegan crunch wrap or something. And, you know, it, those are interesting wins. But like, again, the end of the day is like, you know, I, I still think like, you know, we're short sighted and thinking that's going to save our food mm -hmm. system or that's going to solve the slavery um, issue that we have in the United States. I, I really think from also mm -hmm. um, reading from abolitionist texts is like mm -hmm. now that I've gotten older is like, am I rely on this system and do I believe that this system can change in my lifetime? Um, and so it's, it's really hard, right, when you're working with institutions too that are advocating for systemic policies to change it, but then you're saying, but that's the same system that has constantly failed the people. And it's really interesting to see um, just in the election cycle for 2024, like mm -hmm. the rise of fascism and um, how really dangerous it's gotten, um, you know, compared when I was in college, uh, when Trump was winning, everyone thought Trump was going to lose. Everyone's like, Hillary will win. Um, and then when Trump won, it was actually, um, you know, on campus, it just sounded so dead. Like mm -hmm. everyone was just distraught. Mm -hmm. And it, you start to think like, you know, what, what future do I have in mm -hmm. this society? Am mm -hmm. I a citizen of this mm -hmm. country that's mm -hmm. been colonized? Or am I someone that needs to be for the people? Right, right. And you know, a, a gateway to real change, uh, presumably because of what you've chosen, is the educational path. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in your case, it's more, I think, about raising awareness and providing information and dialogue than formal, formal education in the sense of a university or a college. Um, but presumably, that's, that's how you how you synthesize this and how you want to um, uh, make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, before we leave the immigration topic, the, 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 I would be remiss in not flagging the other way in which environmental concerns and immigration are interrelated is that we are seeing and will continue to see more climate-related migration patterns yeah. um, as uh, either what constitutes arable land or what is survivable land changes throughout the world. Uh, we will continue to see um, more people needing to move um, from either one country or one part of a country to another. Um, is that part of your uh, 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 work as well? Yeah, um, I, I think when it comes to immigration, um, I haven't gone to specific war zones, but I have a lot of friends that work in um, war zone, quote unquote, relief or relief human aid organizations. And just to kind of give context is like, um, mm -hmm. there is like internationally, there is no recognized way for an individual that gets displaced from a climate related disaster to seek asylum. Right. Um, so usually the routes are, you know, I'm going through violence or sexual yeah. violence or other things. And so 
Um, what's happening right now is that United States um, already builds these private um, immigration camps on toxic um, sites. So children right now are being imprisoned mm -hmm. as we speak. But the issue now is going to the fact that there needs to be pathways for safe migration for people who did not cause this climate crisis. Mm -hmm. But instead, what we're seeing in a lot of global north countries, and this, this is where like, it's very freaky with the border and surveillance and mm -hmm. AI tech and biometrics industry, is that um, the Pentagon right, um, increased a large budget uh, of, again, billions of dollars to be sent to them so they can constantly have weaponry. Um, and so in the future, I mean, they're already using drones in the UK mm -hmm. to hunt down migrants. And then you see the robo dogs that they released in New York City a few months ago. Like these are the new technologies and the, the, the ways in which the countries here, like in the global north, are saying, this is how we're going to protect our people. Mm -hmm. We're going to arm with ourselves with surveillance and biometrics to ensure that people cannot come to this country mm -hmm. when recognizing that they are the ones that were complicit in pushing a lot of international policies that decentralize their mm -hmm. economies. And so I, I feel like it's even really horrific to even see, sometimes too, with even people who are immigrants here that grew up and now have anti-immigration rhetoric or views on that. And I'm mm. like, do you not understand why your parents left? Mm. Like your parents didn't leave to get rich. They just wanted a better life mm. for you and your family. Mm. And so I, I think the climate crisis and immigration groups need to work together because I'm not just trying to save the ecosystems of the butterflies and the animals. I'm trying to save everything. Mm. But it's so, um, we're such an entrenched system right now where the immigration industrial complex has so much funding behind mm -hmm. them that, um, you know, even speaking about it and speaking to immigration rights activists is like how they're even being tracked right now. Mm -hmm. um, it is a very scary time um, to know what's happening. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of this that requires real big systemic change, and yeah. that is either frightening to people or it is threatening to take away power and wealth from um, some aspects of the the one percent that hold it and yeah. so that's going to cause a reaction um, we started to talk a little bit about global north global south there in those last couple of comments before we open it up to questions from our audience i, I do want to get your thoughts around what you're seeing on a global level as to what the responses are like um, I believe you got to go to COP26 um, and, and were there to see some of the progress or lack of progress right up front. Um, your, your thoughts on, on what, we're, what we're doing as a species globally? Um, I think everyone, I, I don't think everyone knows COP26, but more United Nations. So the United Nations is an institution that comes together with different governments and they write you know, peace treaties or agreements to countries to basically say, hey, you want to sign this petition that you will end human slavery by 2050? And then the country's like, sure. Obviously, it's not a policy. It's not a commitment. I don't care. I'll sign it. And so I, I have obviously critiques about the United Nations. I think some of my friends that work in the United Nations trying to have climate agendas are really doing really great work. I don't trust certain, the, certain individuals there because what happened to the United Nations is that they're a group of people. So it's activists, it's artists, but it's also fossil fuel industries, mm -hmm. it's border and surveillance industries, it's tech industries. Um, they have celebrities. I mean, Leonardo DiCaprio is a very huge advocate um, in the environmental space. And it's interesting because I was like, I watched Titanic. And now it's interesting to see that you're in this space. And I feel that um, when we talk about climate policies, what's happening right now is that there's this big climate conference. It's done every year. Countries come together. They say what they're going to commit to. The US is like, we still need oil, so we'll, we'll commit to helping. But they don't really agree to give any money. So right now, Global South countries, um, think about um, countries in Latin America, um, Asia, um, Africa, they're saying there needs to be a lost and damaged fund or money from Global mm -hmm. North governments that are committed to giving them money for what they did. And a lot of US, um, Canada and US are like, we're already helping our people back here, so we don't know if we can commit, mm -hmm. which is a lie, because they don't want to give even money to the indigenous communities there. And so um, that's really those conversations that are unfolding. But I, I do think, too, um, it's really tricky, because like, you know, for some people, um, I, don't, I don't think that people who think we can work with corporations and the elite to bring them together to have a conversation mm -hmm. to pass policy should even be in those rooms. Because we know already for a fact that the United Nations is sometimes a business deal for a lot of people. Um, and the second thing is like what some people don't even know is that the United Nations had their own army. 
they are a peace institution. Mm -hmm. They actually have their own private army, which, you know, you start to reckon, like, why do they even have a police system for an institution that advocates for um, peace and on that and, like, gender equality and, like, climate? So uh, I'd say that right now what's happening with this recent conference is that basically the new climate president for this um, climate conference is in Dubai. Yeah. And what's happening in Dubai Pretty is sure. that you can't be gay or else you'll be um, sent to prison. Um, mm -hmm. Women's rights are obviously mm -hmm. in violations. Um, so much atrocities um, that are happening in that country, but the president itself is a fossil fuel mm -hmm. CEO exactly. company. Right. So you're, you're saying like, let's fix climate change next to a person that's making billions or not trillions of dollars for the UAE and people are really upset by that because then it was never like that until mm -hmm. the last few years. Right. Um, yes, that's not a particularly optimistic um, choice yeah. uh, on, on, uh, on their point. Um, and so I think you're, you're doing a very job here of articulating some of the hypocrisy and some of the ironies in, in, our, in, our, in our work globally. We could go through all the sustainability goals, um, which I think are actually really, really the right things, yeah. but it's really more about um, our ability as a species and a set of 190 countries, whatever the number is, to actually execute on, on what those, the, those principles are. Um, I'm going to ask one more question at this point and then take some from the audience. So have questions getting ready to be asked if you, if you can. Um, we're, we're relying um, on the optics of seeing the voice of young people right now as being particularly strong on issues of climate change, environmental responsibility, and so forth. Um, as someone from this generation, do you feel that, um, that that's true? Because the counter narrative is be, it's, it's always the younger generation that are speaking out, and yet, are we really making progress? So I, I've got these two narratives, and I'm not sure which one is the right one or which one you would, uh, you would subscribe to. Yeah, I feel like it depends on who you ask, right? Like, there's an unfold, right? We, we live in a new era with digital media. The, it was the digital information back then. Yeah. I call it the digital cu curation now that's happening. Mm. But I, I feel like it's also a disrespect for me as a young person to say no one's ever done this because there's so, there's so many environmental leaders. Right. and indigenous communities who have who have been doing this work and still continue to do this work and now that they're in their 30s or 40s or 50s um, you know they don't get as the same attention mm -hmm. as they did when they were younger so well, I think there is that um, critique to be said of like you know um, we still live in an ageist society like you know the industry will see me old one day and they'll be like you know well, on to the next young person but I, I do think um, what really worries me um, is the idea of like you know, social media centering, because I, I think I, I meet like, you know, 17 year olds, 18 year olds that are like climate activists mm -hmm. and they, they come up to me and then they say, I've done three TED talks. I have, I'm a founder of a nonprofit. And I'm like, when I was 18, I didn't even know what I was going okay. to do in my life. I don't right. know. Like they're so, in, they're great. They do such great work. I'm not yeah. saying that they, they don't, but it concerns me that like some of the young people are not getting to live like they want to live mm -hmm. or experience themselves. Um, where some of them still struggle with mental health mm. or um, their identity. And it, it, it breaks my heart because I, I feel like I was able to have that experience mm. and I was able to mm. be grounded um, in my work. But I think with young people, um, it's going to happen in the next few years too. Yeah. There'll be a new wave of next climate activists. But you start to think, um, is it becoming a corporatized movement of like, you know, are we becoming part of the corporate structure? And I, and I had this very long conversation with a friend and I was just like, sorry about that. I had this long conversation with a friend. I was like, I don't want my work to become corporatized in that way because originally the message was for the people. It was not for the brands. It was not for the um, corporate, like the, the people I wanted to, you know, get them to listen to. It was for my friends. And so I think reminding people that this movement and many mo movements that you may join whether for LGBT liberation, animal rights, or whatever, um, it's founded on working class, middle class, and low income poor people. Mm -hmm. Like those are our movements. It's never supposed to be about, you know, three elite one percenters, and then we listen to them because mm -hmm. they're the ones who got us into this mess. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a pause and take some questions from our audience, if there are any. Uh, Jana has a microphone. She will come to you if you just raise your hand and. Uh... 
we'll see what questions there are from the audience. And we will also be looking for online questions as well for those of you joining us online. Go ahead. Okay. Does this, oh, it does work. Okay. Um, so I'm 21, just graduated college, and I find myself feeling very like hopeless looking towards the future, especially in the face of a lot of the things you've discussed, like the corporatization and like human atrocities and like that sort mm -hmm. of like negativity. How do you find hope, or not even hope, but just like some balance between? hopelessness looking at our climate future and maybe some positive outcome? I love this question because I think I'll be honest and everyone should be honest is that sometimes I don't know what, what, what's going to happen anymore. And I ask my elders and like my older friends, I'm like, I'm stressed. I don't really know if like what's, I'm really concerned. And they also say to me like, they don't know the one answer. They don't really know, but they tell me what they do know is that what they can change about themselves. I think, you know, as young people, you just graduated college. Um, I'm pretty sure the conversations with your friends are like, did you get a full-time job yet? Are you going to grad school? And it's really frustrating to hear that because you're like, I'm just trying to survive after college. And I, I think what's really given me um, the grace is the very simple things in life that I, that I forgot when I was younger. Like, um, I, I don't really go to movie theaters or other things. I like to go to nature. I practice mindfulness. So um, one of the things I love to do now is to like take my food or breakfast outside or inside, eat it without a phone, um, like slowly chew, enjoy the food, take mindful walks, like 15, 30 minutes walks without your earphones. If you're in a safe space, of course, because um, of course that walking too can be very dangerous for a lot of communities, which is horrific. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think those are the ways that I, that has really helped me keep grounded because as someone that is unfortunately constantly traveling, I go to hotel to hotel or I go to meet different people, um, that is a lot on me as a social person. I, 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 you, you, take, you absorb people's energies. And so I, I think what has helped me is also to focus on what's happening in my community and understanding that, look, it's not your fault that the wildfires in Canada are happening because of you. What you do know is that um, how you can help people like your neighbors or your friends of how to protect themselves. And those are the things where I feel like as young people, we always point at each other and being like, well, did you know this? Or no one's talking about this, so you should know. And it's like, we, we, are, we do live in a shame culture now where in my year, like when I was in college, we lived in Instagram. Now TikTok's obviously the big platform now, but it's like people would always shame me for not knowing what was happening um, about a shooting that happened three days ago when I was traveling to another country and I was like, I, I just can't process the trauma every day. I'm not saying that I have to ignore it. I'm just saying like as humans, like we have to be able to center ourselves too to be like, we're, we're going to be okay. It, it's, I, I've, I've asked a similar question to all now five of our, our guests in this, this season over the last couple of months about what gives you hope and are you hopeful and, and um, optimistic around the topic of the environment. And each of them said, absolutely. Which I, and I was surprised at how strongly that theme stood out from all of the guests, whether it was Gina McCarthy, the former EPA administrator, who spoke to all of the good work that was happening at the policy level, um, Alexandra Cousteau, who was talking about her work in the oceans and um, how resilient the ocean can be and that it's, it's not too late I mean, it could be too late at some point, but it's not yet too late, and that some of the measures that we're doing are actually having a positive effect. Um, through to Wawa Gatherer, who's, um, her, her organization is Black Girl, Black Girl yeah. Environmentalist, um, and uh, just, just the, the building awareness and uh, community that's, that's, that's coming up. And then Steve Kerwood, who's um, been a 30-year host of Living on Earth on NPR, in, he's now in his 70s and um, talks about the entirety of the progress. So I think in the moment, yeah, it, it's, it's often difficult to know what's the most um, optimistic thing, but it was, it was personally interesting to hear all of our guests say that on balance, they're more optimistic than not. We'll take a next question. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, I run an environmental nonprofit, and we have obviously a social media presence. I'm also involved in other uh, climate organizations and what I worry about is the echo chamber and how do I break out of that echo chamber of other like-minded people and get more people into the space. So I wonder how do you feel like you've been able to do that 
And then the other piece of that is moving people from slacktivism to actual activism, going from liking things and posting things to actually getting out and doing things. Yeah, that, I really love that question. I think, you know, it's interesting because on, I have a team now, I'm very grateful and privileged for, and also hired um, young college students that just graduated and now they work full time with me. Um, they, what we did is that we diversified our platform. So like I recognized that a lot of my, in the early days on Instagram, people were just interested in like, you know, very easy terminology or like eco-friendly tips, which I hated doing because I'm like, I do them, but it's like, it's not going to save the world. I started to really focus more on long form storytelling. So different stories that exist on different platforms, the way that they were presented. I think for organizations, what they really, um, all nonprofits honestly really struggle with is that, you know, how do we really communicate to a younger audience? Because a lot of their funders and donors are all older people. And I think that's the scary thing is that um, if we're reliant on only the older donors, because they are the only ones who have money, young people are really broke. Um, we only have like $5, $10 to give. Um, that is a very dangerous system. And the best ways I really have talked to nonprofits is that they need to start transitioning from just focusing on social media to do more in-event in curations. So my team specifically, we started to do events. So we did um, a climate cafe in Los Angeles recently where we brought um, some nonprofit leaders and then young people um, to start to get them involved to understand like what is it that we're really trying to fight for if someone from a nonprofit has eco anxiety and I have eco anxiety I don't work for a nonprofit or a college student has eco anxiety what is it that humanizes us through that experience and I feel that nonprofits sometimes have become a bit disconnected of like I know they're really busy that they're focusing on shutting down certain campaigns or the fossil fuel mm -hmm. pipelines or natural gas but I, I do think that the power of bringing events and curating events with content creators that's the biggest way and the ways I got funding to host events honestly is unfortunately using the influencer model tool of pitching brands to be like hey let's have a uh, branded event I actually I'm doing that right now I'm hosting an event in London in a few weeks and then I'm going to August in Colorado to have a queer mythology foraging event. <laughs> and we're bringing black and indigenous <laughs> people um, to have this from organizations. But that it takes, it, it is very frustrating. And I think now I tell nonprofits like we have to work together because it, it, yeah. yeah. There's an irony um, about the, this that I think we want global change. And so much of our training is around the maximizing messaging to reach the largest yeah. number of people yet the things that are most likely to influence and bring about real change are if I tell you as a friend, hey, I just went to this really cool thing, it's, it's word of mouth, it's hyper-local, and it's micro-targeting that is more likely to bring about real change or real mm -hmm. action, um, unless you disagree. No, yeah, I, mean, I think collaboration is where it's at, but I do think, yeah, like to go from slacktivism to action, yeah. you know, you should be able to like, um, fund people to go to those actions. Like, if, the, if there's like, I know that uh, there's this company called Clean Creatives or Fossil F Fuel, Fossil Free Media, and like, they, I've worked with them a bit, and I tell them like, you know, if you want us to actually cover these events, like, invite us to help cover them. We'll create social media for you all, mm -hmm. so then you don't need to worry about the social messaging. We'll handle that. You all handle the impersonal relationships that need to be built. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it is really. Um, it's a very hard time from all nonprofits and foundations from what I've heard of. Um, and I, I try to have more events, but it, it is very hard um, to constantly go back and forth um, with like brands and then who's like, you know, I try to bring in the idea of the Gen Z, right? How do we bring musicians? How do we bring singers? How do we bring artists together? But then we want the nonprofit partners um, to be there so then people can go from those activations to the nonprofits and the nonprofits tell them to do these activations that does take all time and I, I don't think now there's so much viral videos that exist is that I can't even tell you what was the last viral video I saw and that's why it's like the TikTok generation I use TikTok but it's like people are like I, I went I went viral on TikTok and I'm like everyone goes viral these days <laughs> like it's not right. how do you break out in, among that yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, interesting um, take one more question and I'll check with online Hi, thank you for being here. Um, so I organized with a youth anti-war org called Dissenters, and I recently learned that 
the U.S. military is one of the largest polluters in the world, and I realized that, you know, in climate spaces, I'd never really learned about the intersection between climate and war and militarism. So I was wondering if you could talk more about the connections there and also how we can educate people on that. Yeah, I love this question. Um, I think the reason why it's not in mainstream climate discourses is that it's hid under the umbrella of energy policy. So it's actually funny, I was at this event last year with the Department of Energy and they had someone from the military there and he said, you know, the military is committing to net zero or a green future. And then I basically read from this article and saying, how are you investing in a green future when you've invested X millions of dollars in battle Navy ships, you've invested X amount of dollars in drones, and you've invested X amount of these weaponry to be used. Is this what you call sustainable weaponry now? And he was very uncomfortable by the question. And I, I, did, I did get in trouble after because I was told by the team that I shouldn't be asking those questions. But, I, you know, that, that's, I was like, well, they kicked me out. At least I got kicked out in peace because I had to say it. But the, the intersections obviously come back from like international um, rural development policy is that you recognize that um, colonialism has never ended. It's like still happening. And I, I think I have very grateful um, mentors and scholars who really helped me understand um, you know, why is it that Latin America is poor? Why is Asia poor? Why is Africa poor? And you start to recognize like all of it had to go back to the exploitation route and all of those exploitation routes had to rely on a militarized system. And that led to right the deaths of many marginalized communities. And why is it that so many low income black and brown people of color go into the military right out of college? Because it's an easy way to, to grab them and promise them generational wealth or the American dream, your family be protected. Um, I, I, I do think that though, um, there's a really great organization called Climate Defiance and they do a really direct action and I really like them um, on that end. And I, I think it really goes back to organizing and um, having more structural dialogue, but there is this organization, I think it's called like Veterans Against the War or something. I don't know the, the name of the organization, but anyways, they're former Navy veterans that protest the militarized industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And they talk br very briefly about climate, but there, that is that interesting angle to talk about. I mean, this connection also just reminds me that the Iraq war was more than likely mostly about oil. Yes. Um, that much of the, both the purpose of the Ukraine war yeah. that we're experiencing now and the effects of it are largely to do about the grain growing um, areas of that part of Europe, um, plus the effects of it on energy prices and energy supply across all of Europe make the connection just, just as clear as night and day. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see if we have a question online. Nothing online yet? Okay, great. We'll take one more uh, in person, if there is one. Don't be shy. Um, we we le learned earlier that one of your, um, I don't know if it's your favorite interviewer, but one of your most high profile interviewers was the, uh, the vice president. How did that come about and what was that like? Yeah, I, I think the White House issue was really weird. I got emailed from the government. They were like, we invite you to the White House. And I was like, I don't know. I've said a lot of things about the government. I don't think, I don't, I don't know why they would invite me. I mean, I thought I was on the ban list. And I was actually really paranoid. And I, I texted my friend, I was like, is this real or do you think it's like a virus? And then like, my friend's like, no, I think it's real. It's like the .gov. And then I, anyways, I went to the thing and originally what they told us is that they brought all these like different TikTok influencers or Instagram mm. influencers that do political content. And we were all in this room and they just said, you're gonna just go there to attend the Inflation Reduction Act celebration. Oh. And they put us in this room and there's like secret service on four corners of the room. And I'm like, why they have us locked mm. in this, this room? I was like very paranoid. My phone was also off. Like they, they were very strict about certain things. And so anyway, they, they make us sit down this like very like di long dining table. And we all sit down and we're How's just- How's your heart rate during this? I was just confused. I was like, what is this even about? Like, <laughs> I get like, we're gonna, like, are we gonna meet some politician? Cool, I don't care. But like, and then like, anyways, as we get in, like um, Biden and Kamala walk in and I was like, what the heck? Like, this is so weird. I, during that, is it interesting? Because a lot of people attack me. They're like, why didn't you ask this? And I'm like, they lit I literally like came up with that question right on the spot because they just said, what questions do you have? So I just raised up my hand as instantly to see if I can, and I asked her specifically about environmental justice. Um, but it, 
it, it's sad because like I think her initial response, there was a longer response, but the response that was shown online is that she says, you just have to demand it from the community, like demand it with your community. But so many of my followers were like, what do you mean demand from the community? You're the government, you should be able to do something. And so it was like really hard because I, I recognize that, that that other response that she gave was cut off and it wasn't cut off on purpose, it was just cut off because of editing and my team did that. But it, it, it was really um, frustrating to obviously see that, yes, there's this like romanticization and glamorization of like mm -hmm. US politics. But when I was there, I recognized that, um, you know, everyone interpersonally felt the division that was happening at the Hill. Um, and yeah, I got Biden mentioned, like, I think when I told him I lived in New Jersey, Weehawken, he's like, oh, I used to have a friend that lived there. I mean, that was only our conversation, like, personally. It was really weird. But um, it, it was, um, yeah, it was a very disappointing thing because obviously you recognize that. Um, not everyone was invited to go, but there were definitely black and indigenous communities that had their separate meetings with the, mm -hmm. the president to be able to talk more mm -hmm. serious things. I think for us, they use this more as like a PR thing of like, mm -hmm. look, these young people are going to be involved with us in the elections of 2024. And I was like, I don't know if I'll ever be invited again. But they did invite me back in April, so, but to, I said no. To, oh, right. So you but did I get said no. Back. Yeah, I was like, no, thank you. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, any other questions before we close out? Oh, yeah, we have one more uh, here. Um, whoops. Hi. So obviously, we are in our wonderful Boston Public Library. Um, do you have any book recommendations on the topic of queer ecology or indigenous studies within? ecological spaces, environmental spaces, any way that those of us who don't know that much can learn more? Yeah, um, I'd just say quickly, like, um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Will, Robin Will Kimmerer. She's like a really great indigenous scientist and researcher. You'll probably cry reading that book because it's so, so deep. Um, there's a book I recently read and I met the author. It's called It's Not Too Late by Rebecca Solnit and Thelma Young. And that book was so amazingly written because there's different chapters um, from different climate people and indigenous leaders. And they basically talk about like, you know, the end of the fossil fuel industry is coming and people don't know it. And anyways, I, I really liked it. It was really well written. Um, it's like a very storyline. And the queer ecology book, I think there was one written in the 2000s, very old. I would say that if you don't really like heavy text academic, things of queer ecology don't read it because there's certain authors that really write in an academic lens and it's like very heavy and you're just like it doesn't make any sense to me i i was originally trying to write a book on queer ecology a more modern one but my editors were like no you have to write this book first and then maybe in the second or third book you can write one but um yeah i think um there's the 90s books that exist of queer ecology that i would recommend from octavia but there okay. no, wait, but yeah Maybe, I'm just, I don't want to butcher the names, actually. But anyways, um, I have it on my website if you're interested. And there's an incredible collection of podcasts and other writings from Isaiah as well on, on his website. So um, that can be a jumping off point to, yeah. to some of these, as well as, I think, some stuff on our own. Um, so what's next for you? You're working on a book. Um... Yeah. Um, you know, I tell people, like, if you're ever interested in, like, digital media or more, like, please talk to me. I mean, like, I... It's funny, like my my assistant, he started with me when he graduated college from U Michigan and how he got the job was funny. I asked, I was like, I'm looking for an assistant. He messaged me and he's like, I'm interested. And he put like a wavy emoji. And I was like, that's so Gen Z. Cause I'm not, I, I'm 27. So I don't feel like I'm at the, like, I don't feel like I'm a full millennial, but I also feel like I'm a Gen Z sometimes. And anyways, he did that. And I was like, okay, well like, let's take a call. And I didn't ask for a resume. Um, I just said, give, tell me your story and what you, what you can bring and what you think you have. Mm -hmm. And anyways, he's been probably the best employee I've ever had. Um, he's been with me for like three years. I mean, everyone who works for me um, has stayed with me since then. Um, only one person left, that's because they got a, another job. But um, I think for me, I'm trying to expand my team very slowly to hire more young people. I recognize that everyone does deserve, obviously, equitable pay. They, de they desire a career that's remote, that they have flexibility, and that um, they never need to tell me that they have to take a sick day. They just take it off and just tell me, and I'm like, all right, have fun, like enjoy, like please rest. 
um, because I, I just feel like a lot of young people don't want to work for nine to five jobs anymore. Everyone wants to be freelance. And so, um, yeah, it's interesting to see how we started off remote, me and my assistant, and now um, we're co-creating things together. And now he's, you know, traveling with me to London to do this event. And like, you know, those are things where I feel like a lot of, I wish I had that opportunity out of college because I didn't, wouldn't have wasted two years working in the fashion industry and being like, I can't do this anymore. Um, but anyways, yeah, writing a book, trying to finish that, which is a nightmare because everyone can tell you that, um, editors are very tough and mm -hmm. very deadline based and mm -hmm. I continue to fail my deadlines because I'm just like not in the mood to write and then I get like screamed at to like finish it's the so it's the creative yeah, I process. get a very strongly worded email about my um, deadlines mm -hmm. um, trying to finish that this year hopefully or next but we'll see and then uh, working on more independent video media production projects to mm -hmm. cover climate um, and that's been really hard to get funding for but mm -hmm. it's been working I've, mm -hmm. I've been slowly getting at it um, well, uh, good luck with the book, finishing it, and also the rest of, of your yeah. work. Uh, please join me in thanking our guests this evening, Isaiah Serzan Hernandez. Yeah. Okay.